My name is Jean Cook. I'm a musician and I'm the director of programs for Future Music Coalition. I'm Kristen Thompson. I'm a uh, consultant for Future Music Coalition and, and we're both co-directing our research project called Artists Revenue Streams. So I think we're ready to start with the slides so we can give you a very quick update about the work that we've been doing and an overview of what to expect over the next day and a half as uh, we hear from several different musician types. Mm -hmm. Um, Danny? Here it comes. So um, there have been a number of changes in the music landscape. Obviously, you know this. Uh, Future of Music knows this. We've known this for many years, and we've been meeting about it on a regular basis to discuss it. Um, but one of the questions that has been uh, lingering in our heads for a long time is that of all of the really disruptive and revolutionary changes that have happened, because of the internet, how many of those things are actually good for artists' bottom lines? Um, I think that we have a sense. We know a lot of anecdotes that we've heard, um, a lot of success stories, a lot of new models that are very exciting, but very little hard data. And so the research question that we put together uh, for our project is, um, you know, how are artists making a living? What are the different revenue streams that make up an artist's income? Uh, how does that uh, change F depending on what genre you're in, what stage you are in your career? Um, how has that ratio changed over time? And if so, what factors have conditioned these changes? So um, these are questions that we've been asking. Some people sometimes ask us why income. There's just a wide range of factors that we could be doing research into and looking closer at, but for us, um, we feel like it's important to state kind of up front that the research that we're doing on artist revenue streams is not necessarily going to be a broad examination of the effects of technology on musicians' ability to make a living. Money is clear and consistent, and we feel like um, ultimately being able to make your rent is something that everybody can relate to, and it's also something that across genres and across where you are in your career, um, it's something that you can measure. It's an apples to apples kind of thing. So we have five hypotheses that are part of this research project. The first one being, uh, these are the things that we're testing. The first one being that musicians are relying on revenue from a variety of streams. This might seem obvious, but for us the question is much more complicated because we want to know why, um, you know, on what, what are the factors that determine what revenue streams they're relying on? We know that for many artists, there's a, a difference just based on the role they play, that a songwriter who does not perform has different revenue streams than the performer who never composes. So we want to know about, we, we assume that musicians are relying on a, a variety of revenue streams, but just how much does it change and what are the ratios? The second hypothesis is that the overall revenue pie is smaller for each artist, but more artists have access to revenue. We have a sense that even though there's a, you know, there's a, a, a big pool of money, we have a sense that, that the technology has allowed some artists to gain access to the marketplace, even in small ways. So there may be more musicians having access to revenue, but perhaps the overall pie has diminished. The third hypothesis we're looking at is, for performers, money from touring or playing live shows is probably the biggest portion of their revenue pie. This is sort of based on anecdotal evidence that we understand about how it works, but we wanted to test that to see if it's really true. The fourth one is that for, for songwriters and composers, they might be seeing diminished revenue from their compositions from record sales. This is um, pretty much based on our understanding of what's going on in the marketplace for retail sales and that mechanical royalties based on the sales that go to the songwriter or composer tend to, well, they're going to diminish just because there's fewer records being sold. But we want to test this, this hypothesis to see if it's actually true. And finally, we're wondering, does location matter as much as it used to? Because there's a lot of thought out there that the internet has, has um, removed the barriers for artists to work in any location. So do you need to be in New York or Nashville or Los Angeles? We're asking this question as part of this work to see if location still matters. So the population of the study um, is U.S. citizens or permanent residents, 18 or older, and uh, at least six commercially released tracks. The way we define commercially released tracks, it, can, it just needs to be widely released. It can be digital only. It can be self-released. And uh, we also take some other factors into account. 
uh, the percentage of personal income that comes from music, number of hours a week spent as a musician, and also professional memberships. Um, it's very difficult to measure musicians as a population, and that's one of the reasons why we kind of came up with these, um, these limitations to our study. Obviously, there isn't a phone directory of all the musicians in the United States. Uh, there's no single organization that you can go to. So uh, this was a big challenge for us. Um, when we thought about how to reach out to the musician community, we started by kind of identifying all of the different types of musicians that we could think of as musicians ourselves and, and as part of the music community. So we came up with like 25. So these are the 25 that we started with to give you a sense of how the breadth of the roles that we're looking at and the types of musicians and the different communities that we're reaching out to. Uh, we're guided in our work uh, by a research advisory committee, a combination of social scientists and attorneys and uh, policy people, uh, national organizations that represent artists. Um, these are folks who've been very involved um, in our work and helping to shape, um, shape our protocol and also to give us feedback at every step of the process and we're very grateful to them, so we just wanted to acknowledge them. Yeah. So, maybe the, we wanted to talk just a bit about the methodologies that we're using. There are three that we're using simultaneously because um, we think that just one of these methodologies on its own wouldn't capture the complexity of the question. Or it wouldn't be able to answer the question as well. So we're doing three things at once. We're doing qualitative interviews with musicians and composers. We're doing uh, case studies, like financial case reviews I'll show you a bit about. And third, we're doing um, a big online study. So briefly, the interviews, we are, um, as Jean mentioned, we have these music musician types. We identify a person that kind of matches the type you know, we might find a player in a major orchestra. And we will interview that person. It's about an hour long. And after we do the interview, we ask them for peer referrals. So this is uh, in research, uh, social science research, it's called snowball sampling. So we ask them for a couple of peer referrals, and then we talk to their referrals, and then we ask them for referrals. So it's, we're trying to do four waves of referrals through, through the interview process. And we've done about 70 so far, I think I counted. Um, we have more to go, um, and it's been really fascinating to talk to the musicians directly. The second um, methodology is financial case studies. And this is where we take a look at well, some of the musicians that we're interviewing or working with allow us to look at their financial records, their bookkeeping, their musician-based um, their musician -based finances. And um, we can, when we have access to, to both the income and expense side, we're able to do um, sort of revenue pies based on a particular year's worth of income. And we can also do time series that shows how things have changed over time based on different revenue um, sections. Um, we've completed three so far, a jazz composer, chamber music ensemble, and an indie rock sideman. And we have more underway. Finally, we have a survey that's open right now called Money for Music. And it's online. It's been open since September 6th. It's open until October 28th. At that URL, futuremusic.org slash ARS is the way, the entry point for it. Um, it's uh, collecting music, uh, information from thousands of US-based musicians and composers. If you are a person that fits that bill, if you are in the US at least 18 years old and um, a musician or composer of any genre, of any career level, please take the survey because we want as much data as possible for us to capture the rich, complex nature of it, what it's like to be a musician today. And it, what we'll do with the survey findings once it closes, we'll synthesize it with the interview work and the financial case studies and start releasing reports and, and findings in 2012. So one more note about the survey, because this is the most statistically significant data set that we're pulling together with this research over the three years that we're doing this. Um, we did think about how to reach out to musicians in the United States, and that was one of the things um, that I think was very challenging, because as we mentioned before, it's very hard to reach certain populations of the music community, and how do you kind of put together a net that's gonna be able to capture as many or try and touch as many musicians as possible. So we're very grateful to the 150 organizations that have helped us in uh, promoting this survey. Um, we've, they vary from uh, national uh, musician organizations, unions, the American Federation of Musicians has been 
a great partner in some of this work. We're also working with technology companies, and we're also working with informal networks of musicians uh, and national service organizations and, and many different kinds of, of places. We're also reaching out uh, to places like radio stations. We're asking jazz radio stations across the country to run a PSA about the work that we're doing because we figure even if uh, some musicians may not be joiners, maybe they're listening to the radio. So there are a lot of ways that we're reaching out. We're very, very thankful to our partners and we've had a very strong response initially uh, to the study, but it's still open. We know we haven't reached everybody. Um, we know that this is kind of a, an, a very important moment because this is the moment where people who feel like they aren't usually counted can come, step up, and be counted. Um, after October 28th, that won't be possible. So we do feel like it's, it's really important to try and spread the word at this time. Oh, well, one thing that I should mention is that participation in, in our study, uh, whether it be the case studies or participating in an interview or adding your information into our survey is completely voluntary, it's completely anonymous. Um, the data on the survey, it gets aggregated with thousands of others. So it'll give us a rich snapshot of the status of musicians' revenue streams in 2011, but it also completely and totally, it'll respect everybody's privacy. Your name will not be attached to it in any way. Right. So finally, we just wanted to talk about the anticipated outcomes. It's really difficult to talk about this because of course we don't have the data in hand yet, but what we do think it might be is some, we have five of them. Um, first of all, I think it'll be a comprehensive analysis of how musicians from a lot of different genres are being compensated in the digital age. It really is about the revenue streams and what's going on, and how, how these revenue streams are changing. I think it's, you know, consider this a, a benchmarking effort because this is um, an effort that hasn't been a, a tried on this scale yet. There's been some great work done on particular genres in the past, but we hope this is a benchmarking effort that helps us understand how it's moving in the future. Second, I think it, we could think it could help service organizations and advocacy groups better serve their constituencies, um, you know, help them map policy objectives or, you know, understand what their members are looking for. Third, I think it will make a more informed in case, more informed case to the general public about the complex nature of being a musician in the digital age. Um, you know, there's a lot of assumptions and memes out there that talk about, oh, you know, why do I need to buy a record? Everybody makes money off touring, does it? But these things are based on sort of anecdotes and you know assumptions. We really want to have some data to understand what's really true, and make a you know enrich the public conversation about what it's like to be a musician. Fourth, it might be an external assessment on, the, on how some of these emerging technologies are affecting musicians' ability to make a living. Um, and finally, um, it could have policy implications. Um, it may, have, um, may highlight how artists' revenue is different um, uh, in different genres or playing different roles, and it may serve as a way to leverage change. So we've tried to bring some of what we've already learned uh, already to this event. The money for the money from music conversations at our conference will focus on s four s specific subsets of the industry. We'll be looking at the songwriter experience, the side musician experience, jazz as a genre, and then also direct-to-fan relationship building. Our first conversation, uh, which we'll be starting in just a moment, is going to look at how musicians are leveraging their brand using technologies to create closer connections to their fans. The songwriter conversation this afternoon will explore how the business of songwriting and producing has changed and how likely promising new revenue streams are to make a real difference. Tomorrow we're going to look at side musicians and explore how freelance and session work has evolved over the years and where the revenue flow to sidemen has changed with the arrival of the digital age. And finally, uh, we'll look at the world of jazz music and learn how, while the world changes around them and the world changes around us, certain elements of the business actually stay quite the same.